Good evening, everyone. To what extent do our beliefs impact our responses? To get started, I'm just gonna have a little fun with you guys in the audience here, if you don't mind participating. I'm gonna show you a picture, and I just want you to be cognizant of how you initially respond to this picture. Are you ready? How many of you maybe remember the time you went to the circus when you were a little kid, smiled on the inside by show of hands? Okay, thank you. And how many of you, just like me, totally creeped out by this picture? Yeah. It's amazing how one picture can elicit two different responses based on what we choose to believe about them, right? I'm going to show you one more. Here's a picture of a sun on a summer day. Now, if I asked most of us in here, we would say that our response is that, well, we're happy because the sun is out. We believe it's going to be a nice day. But I'd like you to consider the life of a farmer out west. He has three kids, a wife. His crops haven't grown in about a week. He sees the same sun that you and I see, but his response isn't happiness. His response is mild depression. He's worried because he might not be able to support his family. Both the clown and the sun are actual examples of Barry Kaufman's stimulus belief response model, which says that in our lives, the stimulus that we face are in a sense neutral. But depending on what we choose to believe about it will ultimately impact our responses. And I've actually used this theory to work with teachers because just like you and I can't control the sun coming up early in the morning, teachers all across the country can't control the students that walk in and out of their classrooms year after year, the parents that come along with them, their bosses, or their colleagues. But depending on what they choose to believe about all the stimuli that they face on a daily basis will ultimately impact the response and impact the choices that they make in their careers. And it's these teacher beliefs that lie at the core of personal growth and are developed early on in a teacher's career based on the local circumstances and situations that they're hired into. And it's also these beliefs that transfer over and influence the students in the classroom as well. And if we can focus on these, we can, tra we can transformationally change how we talk about teacher growth and teacher development. So I'd like to share with you two examples of how I use the stimulus belief response model to help teachers identify a limiting belief, and hopefully inspire you by some of the changes that took place. The very first teacher had a classic classroom management issue. His fifth hour was out of control. And when I sat down with him, I said, is it possible that just like the sun, another teacher could have a different belief about your fifth hour, which would cause them to respond in a different way? He said, yeah, it's possible. So I said, what is it then about your fifth hour that's causing you all this anxiety. And almost instantaneously, he said, you know what? They're crazy, that's why I have anxiety. And I said, okay. What is it about crazy people then that are causing you this stress? And he thought about it for a second. He said, you know, I don't think they respect me. I need to have respect. So we stopped there for the day and I said, when you walk into the classroom tomorrow, when you start to feel that anxiety you talked about, I want you to reach in your pocket, pull out this three by five card, which I wrote on there. What is it about my need for respect that is causing me anxiety? He did exactly that. We debriefed at the end of the next day. He comes running down to my office. He's like, you're not going to believe this. We need to talk. I walked into my fifth hour. I felt that stress that, I, that we've talked about. And it was consuming me. So I reached it in my pocket, pulled out the three by five card, and I read it. And for the very first time, the stress that I felt was out there. There was a gap between me and the stress. It wasn't my students. It was my need for respect. And I'm going to take it one step further. It was my need to have control. And for the next two weeks, not once did we talk about a student in this fifth hour. We talked about his need to have control. We talked about the difference between him feeling responsible for his students and actually learning to respond to his students. But this man made a transformational change in how he saw classroom management because he was able to identify a limiting belief that was holding him back. Another teacher had an issue with a colleague. And all of us know in here that issues with colleagues can last a very long period of time and can be toxic to the culture and climate of a school. So when I sat down with this woman, I asked her, what is it about this colleague that's causing you this stress and anxiety? And she said, you know what, they're two-faced, I can't trust them. I said, okay, what are you stressed out about two-faced people? Why does that cause you anxiety? And she thought about it and she said, you know, I guess I just don't know what they're saying about me, I, you know, and I feel left out. So I wanted to push her just a little bit more and I said, you know, in my career I feel left out as well but I don't respond with the same amount of anxiety that you do, so what is it about having anxiety that really stresses you out? I mean, the feeling left out that stresses you out. And she said, you know, she said a belief that was so raw and so real, she said, sometimes I just wonder if I'm enough. And again, for the weeks to follow, it wasn't about the colleague anymore. We talked about self-care. We talked about where she looks for validation. 
and actually had her go back and talk to this person, and she realized that that person had no power over her whatsoever. And so both of these teachers, with the classroom management and the colleague, took a stress that was seemingly out of their control and realized it was a manifestation of some limiting belief that they were holding on to. And once they realized what it was, the stress dissipated and went away. And when we develop teachers, we always seem to develop them on two areas. We develop them on the knowledge of their content, we provide them with strategies and resources, or we develop them on the knowledge of their student, we provide them with data. But very rarely does this knowledge of self come to the forefront of conversation when we talk about teacher growth and development. And I think one of the reasons for it is that we think there needs to be a couch or a therapist in order to make this happen. I recently was working with a teaching staff where they developed their whole professional development around this idea of beliefs. The feedback we got from teachers was, I, my beliefs matter to the culture and climate of this school. I need to take into consideration the beliefs of my colleagues. And that school began to make a transformational change because they focused on something that was at the root of the, of the problem with the culture and climate of their school. So the way I see it is we're at a crossroads. We can either continue to develop teachers by giving them strategies and resources that they may or may not use, and growth in schools around the country will be sporadic at best, or we can start to realize that teaching is a 30-year career of self-discovery based upon the beliefs that teachers have about themselves in the classroom, and we can start to develop teachers from within. My name is Joel Mobley. Thank you.